Welcome to the You Got Into Wear podcast. I'm your host, Joy Wade, author, college admissions coach, and founder of You Got Into Wear. Every Monday, I bring you actionable interviews with college admissions experts and students who share their insight on college applications, essays, scholarships, financial aid, test prep, and more to help you get admitted into your top choice universities. Let's get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the You Got Into Wear podcast. I am so excited that you are listening to today's episode. If you're a high school student who wants to learn the ins and outs of the college admissions process and eliminate the stress of learning everything on your own, you have to consider getting your free college admissions glossary guide from You Got Into Wear. The College Admissions Glossary is a downloadable PDF that provides over 50 college admissions and financial aid related terms and definitions for students. The college application process is overwhelming and the glossary will eliminate hours of research and confusion while filling out applications for admission, scholarships, and financial aid. You can download the free guide at glossary.yougotintoware.com. That's glossary.yougotintoware.com. Let's get straight into today's episode. I am so delighted to welcome today's podcast guest, Brooke P. Hansen from Super Tutor TV. On today's episode, we discuss how Brooke scored a perfect on the SAT and ACT, Brooke's experience attending USC and Stanford, her best tactics for each section on standardized tests, and what separates a high score from a perfect score. Lastly, we'll talk about if you can get into college with a low test score. And just to double check, um, pronunciation, Brooke Hansen. That's right. It's all right. Hopefully easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some people, it's just way different. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. Brooke Hansen, founder and CEO of Super Tutor Media and the popular YouTube channel Super Tutor TV, has long been a test prep expert. As an adult, she scored perfectly on the SAT, a 36 out of 36 composite and 12 out of 12 essay on the recent official ACT, and has been tutoring for over a decade, working with classes, small groups, and individual students to increase their opportunity in the college admissions marketplace. She's worked for or contracted with over 10 education companies and has also developed curriculum for three different education firms and everything from test prep to reading comprehension and debate. Brooke launched Super Tutor Media to combine her talents, bringing education and test prep to high school students in a way that is sharp, informative, and entertaining. Her YouTube channel, Super Tutor TV, has over 100,000 followers and 6.5 million views. Brooke graduated with honors from Stanford University with a BA in American Studies and also holds an MFA in, cin- in Cinematic Arts production from the University of Southern California. Fight on. Welcome, Brooke. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast today. Thanks, Joy. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. So just to get started, tell me a little bit about yourself in your own words. What are students coming to you for? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what I've been doing for the past, say, 15 plus years or so is working with students to try to just help them move forward with preparing for college. So part of that is definitely test prep. That's kind of my bread and butter work that I do with students. Um, So if students aren't scoring what they want on a test, I work with them to try to create a plan so that they can achieve their goals. And then the other thing that I think students turn to me too is also um, just trying to put together their applications. A large part of that is uh, the essay portion of the application. And I think because I have this kind of storytelling background, right? I went to film school and that's all about how do you tell a good story? How do you keep people engaged? And how do you use that really powerful tool that we have as human beings, narrative, to connect with others and to um, say something that's worth saying? So that's kind of the wheelhouse of what I I deal with and and how I help students. Um, I typically work with one-on-one students and at any given time, I have anywhere from 10 to 20 students at a time. I work with people in person, I work with people on Skype. Um, And in the past, I've taught classes and all that kind of stuff, but but that's what I'm up to right now. 
uh, at least on, on the student end. And uh, yeah. Awesome. So before we get into the strategy, today we're going to be talking about um, test prep and we're going to be talking about essays a little bit. But before we get into that, um, you went to two amazing schools. You went to Stanford for undergrad and my school, USC, um, for graduate. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience at both? Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, in terms of going to Stanford, like... I think that was probably one of the greatest experiences that I've been blessed to have in my life. Um, and I know I elaborated if anybody out there has seen my YouTube videos and all that stuff. Um, I am a huge fan of Stanford. I, I had a great uh, experience there. And I think what it was is that I always felt like in high school, I was always fighting to jump through all these hoops. And I felt all this pressure to, you know, get A's and achieve and you know, do all these activities and like be this all-star. Um, but then finally, when I got to college, uh, it was more about actually the ideas and what it is that, um, that, you know, drives us as people. And so the entire way that we learned was based more on finding a, an interesting point of view or uncovering kind of how things work. Um, and I feel like that kind of intellectual curiosity and passion and vitality and all that good stuff that it was, it was really cool for me as someone who had and harbored all of those kind of impulses in myself, but had never been in a community where I feel like the other people around me had that where instead the community I was in just wanted me to be achieving because you, you know, oh, then I get an A, um, that was very satisfying. And so, um, yeah, I really had, uh, it, from an academic standpoint, I, you know, I really had a great experience there and I love the alumni there and everything else. I mean, USC was a very different experience, I would say, because, uh, I went to grad school there for film school. And so, and, and the other thing about art school, like inevitably is that I think, uh, uh, you know, you show up on the first day of class and your professor tells you like, who wants to be a film director? And like, everyone raises their hand and they're like, only one of you will ever direct and it will be TV. You know? oh my goodness. And, and so they're very, I mean, it was a very different experience from going to Stanford where it's like, you can change the world. And like, you're going to like make this world a better place to going to a place that was very much like an art, an art school where, where they completely like squashed your dreams the day you walked in. And then, and then we're like, okay, now time for you to figure it out and pick up the pieces. And and that's not to say that I didn't have some good experiences at USC. And it's not to say that I didn't make great connections there and that I didn't learn really great skills. And I will say like what I do now and having a YouTube channel, like I, you know, I don't think I could have done what I do now in the same way that I do now if I didn't have that experience. Um, and I have a great network and like David, our company who um, is kind of our lead producer, he went to USC and I never would have made that connection with him if I hadn't have had that background. Um, and, and it certainly prepares you and teaches you how to use media effectively. Uh, but I would say like, you know, coming in as a grad student, they treat you a little bit differently. They're a little more hard knocks about things, um, potentially, but, uh, it, you know, it's like you, you learn and, and you figure it out and you integrate, um, all the things that they do offer you. And what I do think is that those skills that I did learn at USC, um, the level of professionalism and, and how to approach a project and how to be thorough, all those things definitely go into my practice now. Um, and I'm very thankful for the context that I have. So there you go. Um, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, I feel like everyone's experience is different. Like you said, art school, that's just a whole nother realm. Yeah. Um, like yeah. even here at USC undergraduate students, like depending on the school you're in, you're having like way different experiences, like from like people I know who are like in architect architecture, they're like, sure. I'm dying um, right. people <laughs> in different fields. So that's also like, yeah, that's some sure to think about. Yeah, I'm sure it's different too as an undergrad, like, you know, the experience at each college is different. And that's not to say that like, that if you want to go to film school, don't go to film school. But I do think, you know, there's, there's a reality and, and I try to be real about stuff, I think in my YouTube channel, but there is a reality to the future that I think sometimes when we're younger and we're idealistic and we're in high school and we think, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And we have all these dreams and these visions that, you know, reality is going to start rearing its head and college is a place where sometimes that happens, but it doesn't mean that you're going to quit or that everything's over. And I, and I also think that 
part of our world is, is learning how to adapt. And so a lot of the skills that we do learn and a lot of the lessons that we do learn, you know, it's, it's rebounding from those and, and moving forward and all that good stuff. So, yes. So let's get into what everyone is here for that, um, those tests. So first of all, like congratulations for scoring perfect. That's like something that is rare to hear people scoring perfect on both the SAT and ACT. So just to clear things up, did you do that when you were back in high school or was that something that came later on? No, I mean, as you said in my bio, I did that as an adult. So like everybody who's like completely intimidated, like don't be super intimidated because the truth is, is that I teach this to students every day. And basically what happened is I knew some friends who were tutors and their tutoring company made them retake the SAT. And I was like, huh, that's an interesting idea, like to go in and take the test and have that experience that a student has and the, you know, and the test was different. And so I was like, you know, I think I could get a perfect score. And I just kind of challenged myself to do it. And I was like, I'm going to try and see if I can do this. Um, and, and I did it on the first try. Uh, and I actually took that SAT at USC um, back in the day when I took it as an adult. Um, but yeah, and then, um, and then the ACT, I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to try this again too. So it's, it's, yeah, maybe it sounds intimidating, but the truth is, is, is more than anything, what I was trying to create is a proof of concept for the kids that I work with and the parents that I work with and just say, Hey, like, you know, I've been tearing this test apart for years and I really know it. Um, and that was kind of my goal. I have scored perfectly. Granted, like when I was in high school, I did score perfectly on math quite often. And I was kind of like a big math person in high school. And I had like won awards in math and I was like on the state like the best math team in the state my freshman year in high school and all that kind of good stuff. So um, in that sense, I did score perfectly on the SAT, the ACT, the PSAT in high school, the GRE when I got out of high school um, on the math section. So I did have some perfect scores, but you know, that writing and language, it, it was a, a process to figure out. Awesome. So even then, just to calm everyone's nerves, do you need a perfect score to go to college? No. Oh, my goodness. Of course not. You don't need a perfect score at all. Um, nowhere close to it. I think uh, so often we all get so nervous about this college application process. And it's like, oh, my God, like my score is not good enough. And it's so nerve wracking for so many students. But I think my best advice is like, you know, if people just try hard and they put some time and effort into it and improve upon whatever they start with, you know, that's going to help bring them more opportunity. Uh, the other thing that I think too, is that a lot of students overlook, um, the fact that test scores are really only one component of your application. And I would say, depending on the college, how important they are varies. Um, for example, you know, I work with some students and it's like, they have amazing test scores. It's like, you know, they might have a 1570 on the SAT or they might have a 35 on the ACT. But if they have zero activities and they have like nothing else going on in their lives because they've sacrificed everything just to have really good scores and really good academics, it's almost impossible to figure out like, what are we going to write about in your essays? Because, you know, if all you do is academics, like how do you develop who you are and how do you, you know, be an interesting person and like uh, figure out what your vision is for life? And I think those things are actually more important than the test score in some ways. It doesn't mean it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean you can have like a 28 on the ACT and expect to, you know, get into a top 10 school. But yeah, I think, uh, you know, it could mean that a 33 on the ACT and really amazing activities could get you into Stanford, whereas a 35 with, you know, a, a dull resume, um, you know, doesn't speak as much. So yeah, I'm glad you made that point. So now that we have all the misconceptions off the table, let's get into some strategy. So the way I wanted to approach this was kind of like, what is the absolute minimum that people can do? And the re what I mean by that is you posted a video about um, things you can do to improve your SAT scores without like getting super into studying, like just simple things you can adjust with your strategy that um, are sure. going to make a big difference. So could you kind of point out some things that students like could just do on their next test to kind of improve their score? Sure. Um, yes. The how to improve your SAT score without studying. Um, the, what I would say is, um, one thing is just having the right mindset. I mean, I always, here's what I'll say, like caveat. I always say you should at least take one practice test before you go in and take the SAT. Just because a lot of times 
It's just the experience is different and it could be a false start. And like, it's just worth it to do that. And if you can't do that at minimum before you go, and some of this is not necessarily in my how to improve your SAT score without studying, but they're in like my cram videos and things like that. But the other thing that I'll say is be sure if you're going to go in and take an SAT, at least like download a copy of one, even if you don't have time to take the whole thing and like work two or three problems and read the directions at the top of every section, just like on the baseline. Um, but in terms of how to improve your score without necessarily studying, I mean, I think a lot of it is mindset. Um, I think sometimes students go into these tests and they have this sort of defeatist attitude of, oh man, if I read a question, I'm like, what, this is so hard. You know, they just start guessing and they just shrug their shoulders and they say, I don't know. Um, and that's a big issue that I see, even with students who approach the test, they assume that this is a test that you just read the question and then you like know the answer. Cause it like shines on your brain from heaven. Um, and I just don't think that that's how this test works. I mean, certainly not like the reading and the writing and language portions. Um, and obviously in the math, you need to calculate things. And I think the corollary in the math is, um, is not the idea that you instantly know the answer when you look at the question, but that when you look at the question, you instantly know how to approach it. Um, the truth is you are going to confront something on the SAT that catches you off guard, 99% of students at least. Um, and so you just have to be ready for that and know it's coming and know what you're going to do when you get into that situation. You know, have a game plan like, okay, when I get to a math problem I don't understand, the first thing I'm going to try is to break it down one step at a time and just step forward and see how I do step after step. Um, and then just try to jump into the numbers, soak myself in the problem and push forward. Um, and then maybe the second plan of attack on math questions is, you know, if I spend more than 60 seconds on a single math question, I'm going to move on and I'm just going to be disciplined. And if, if my process doesn't work, then I'm going to give up, move on, and then I'll come back to it when I have more time at the end, if I get through everything. Um, so as long as you can kind of mentally prepare, you know, have a game plan for my first plan of attack is I'm going to fight back, right? I'm not just going to give up and guess. Um, and I think that's a big mistake students make. And then the second piece of that is know when to give up, right? So know when to fight, fight first, and then give up second instead of just always giving up. I think that's that's one thing that um, students can remember and just like a way that you can think about approaching the test so that um, so that you don't just get to the end and then and sort of feel helpless and sort of feel like there's nothing you can do. Yeah, thanks for establishing that your mindset has to be in the right place. Don't give up just because one question gets hard um, because that can just throw you off for the rest of the test. So I wanted to um, ask you, um, now that someone has their mindset right, what where do they begin? Like if a student has never taken this test before, where do they even like start when building like a study strategy? Yeah, I mean, the first place to always start is, you know, get a practice test. Now, sometimes that can be a lot of schools will offer the PSAT sophomore year, and that's a great starting place if you get it sophomore year. If you don't get the PSAT till junior year, that's cool as long as you're not an extremely competitive candidate. So what I mean by that is if you expect to be scoring and say the top 5% of scorers on the SAT, or you have no more than say five or six Bs on your transcript, um, I would actually recommend that you start looking at this stuff earlier than your junior year PSAT, because if you play your cards right, you might be able to become a National Merit Commended student or a National Merit Scholar or something like that. And that basically means that if you score above the 99th percentile or 98th percentile or so on the PSAT, you may qualify for this kind of recognition. So in order to not throw that away, throw that opportunity away, I do recommend the top students get started a little bit earlier, but otherwise, you know, you can start with the PSAT. And what that is, is it's uh, a slightly shorter version of the SAT that you can take in your school. Um, and then you'll get that back a couple months later and it kind of shows how you do. And I like that um, because it's like kind of an official administration. So you have the nerves going a little bit. It's a little bit more of an accurate picture perhaps than had you just taken a practice test at home. But you can also take a practice test at home. You know, you can print out, there's plenty of free SATs on the internet. The College Board has released eight free SATs. And if you're taking the ACT, there is a free ACT available at act.org in a packet called Preparing for the ACT. You can download that, print it out, time it, take it with a bubble sheet, 
um, sit down hopefully in one lump sum of, you know, three and a half, four hours, whatever it takes for the test and see how you do. Um, and that's really the first place to start. And then after you see how you do, the next step is where do I want to go to college and what are my goals? Uh, and, and when you figure that out, then you can get on the internet and start searching for what kind of a score is going to give me, uh, you know, enough traction to be able to apply and possibly get in there. Um, so those are the first steps. Um, obviously there's more steps if you want to be more prepared, but that's the first thing is know where am I at and, and what are my goals? Um, that's step number one. Great. So say a student is definitely trying to go to one of these really selective schools, um, and they know they have to score pretty high. And the first time they take it, they are pretty average. How do they level up in their scores? Like, what do you suggest a student do if they know they have to go up a couple of points on their exam? Yeah. So, I mean, if you know you need more points, um, there are several options for prep and it kind of depends on um, which test are you taking and what is your budget. Uh, What I would say is that obviously self-study is something that anyone can afford. And there are free resources on the internet, I think, for both the SAT and the ACT um, that you can use to help you. Um, I know I have videos on how to self-study for the SAT and another video on how to self-study for the ACT. So if people are looking to go that track, you know, I can kind of give you my advice as a private tutor for what's worked with my private students. Um, so that's kind of one avenue and that can work. The only disadvantage that I see really to the, the self-prep is that if you're not really good at pattern recognition, it can be hard for you to actually turn your mistakes into rules that you can then follow on subsequent tests. And I do have some students, and that's why they come to me as a private tutor, that they try to self-study. And what ends up happening is they just keep making the same mistakes. And that's because they make up rules that aren't actually rules, that they think they see a pattern, but they don't actually see the pattern that is the pattern, if that makes sense. Um, So that's that's kind of the limitation of self-study is that is that you might not be able to read the test as accurately as possible. That being said, there are ways to try to get that expertise. Obviously, the the gold standard, so to speak, is to get a private tutor, but I realize that that's prohibitively expensive for a lot of people. And the other thing is not all private tutors are created equal. So you might have some private tutors that really understand this test, and then you're going to have a lot of other private tutors out there that may have just gotten a great score themselves, but may have no idea why. Um, and sometimes those kind of tutors aren't as helpful either. Again, they're not much more helpful sometimes than self-study. Um, so you want to make sure that you have good instruction, a good teacher, and the same goes for a class. You know, I think the value of a class really comes down to who is your teacher. If you have an awesome teacher, then they're going to be able to provide those insights. They're going to be able to break down the test and say, this is what's going on. And this is the pattern that you need to learn as opposed to somebody who might point out the wrong pattern, who might not even see patterns at all, and is just subjectively explaining questions or trying to teach you some basics, and then you don't necessarily know how to integrate those into your practice. Um, So those are kind of the options. You know, you've got self-study, and then you've got kind of seeking out more information. And then the other thing you can do in your self-study is try to seek out the opinions of experts in book form. One of my favorite tools that you have as someone who does self-study is books written by independent tutors. And what's great about our digital revolution is that there are a lot of wonderful self-published tutors who are experts on this test, you know, who like me have been working in this industry for like 15 years. You know, there's Erica Meltzer, there's the College Panda, there's, you know, and we're actually, I actually have three years in the making an ACT math book that we've been working on forever and ever. It's a two-part series and I'm literally working on the last chapter and I hope it'll be out in the next couple of months. But, um, but I think when you get somebody who really knows this test inside out because they've been working with it, you know, you may study for the SAT or the ACT for two months. And these people, people like, like, these people who write these books, we've been studying it for anywhere from two to, you know, 20 years. So um, when you can get that kind of expert insight, I think even if you just get it in book form, if you can't afford the private tutoring or you can't afford the course, you know, and we also have like an online course. And in that online course, like if you learn better visually, or if you learn better from somebody talking through things with you, you know, an online course could also be a good option. We have one for the ACT. We have another one for the SAT coming out soon. And what I try to do is kind of replicate that private tutoring experience, giving you guys the same tips, the same lessons, the same insights, but explained in a human to human way. So hopefully it's not completely boring. Um, you know, so that's an option too. But I think there's a lot of different ways to improve your score. And the most important ingredient really is you. Awesome. Yeah. So that's really great. Um, for me personally, um, 
I took the ACT um, and I really wanted to score a 31, um, but I had scored a 27 the first time around. So I did get a um, tutor who helped me, guided me through that process. And it really did help um, just because there is small tricks and things that you need to be paying attention to. And it's not really like as a student, um, you don't really pick up on those things, but a tutor was really helpful. Even just after a couple of sessions, um, if you can't afford like a whole like series of sessions, maybe just try one um, and see how it goes and see if it's right for you. Because that really was the reason why my score um, went up as many points as it did. Yeah. I mean, it- yeah, obviously. Yeah, like I said, tutoring is great. And if you can find somebody who gets the test and who can share those kind of secrets with you, that's great. Um, and But I just do like to encourage people, like, because I know that there are kids out there, especially some of my viewers who, like, just can't afford that kind of stuff. And so, like, you know, and then my message is it, soak up all the free stuff you can. You know, I do give away some of my secrets in some of my YouTube videos, and I'm sure there's other resources out there like that, too. Um so yeah, the other place that you can kind of hang out if you really want to nerd out on test prep is Reddit. So there's my other two cents. Great. <laughs> and what are students looking for on Reddit? Um, yeah, well, there was an SAT and an ACT board on Reddit. So like, and to me, <laughs> it's so funny because I read all these like, you know, these articles on that are like talking about, there's all these controversies right now going on with the college board and then ACT and like all this stuff. But it's so funny because I saw one of them talk about like the deep web. And I'm like, I think the deep web is just Reddit. Like (laughs) if you really want to get into like where people are talking about, where people are really nerding out about these tests and they're like aggressively self-studying and trying to find every resource they can. And I will say, I do think there's some bias in some of the, there's a little bit of group think right now going on on Reddit on the SAT board that as a private tutor, I'm not 100% on board with all the advice that these kids give you. So take everything with a grain of salt. But, um, but if you really want to nerd out and, and find a group of people who are talking about all of sort of the ins and outs and how to prep for this thing and what has worked for some people and what hasn't worked for other people, um, I do think, you know, there are a lot of people talking it up on Reddit. Um, and, uh, if you just plug into those boards and start surfing around, I'm sure you're going to find in that community some answers. So. Awesome. And do you think that, coursework alone can is prepping students for the SAT. I feel like parents especially think that like what their student is learning in school should be enough for them to be ready for the SAT or the ACT. Um, I mean, I think that's like a belief that previous generations had of these tests, that that's what they were supposed to be. But I think it's very evident that that's just not true because these tests test in ways that are fundamentally different to what we learn in school. And I, you know, enjoy, I don't know like what your point of view is on that or what you've experienced, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think this, the test is very specific in ways that, that most high schools aren't covering. Could you, um, possibly do that from your high school? I, you know, it, it, the other thing I'll say is it just really does depend on the high school. I will say I scored perfectly on the SAT, the PSAT, um, and the ACT math sections when I was in high school. And that's because I had a really awesome math teacher when I was a freshman in high school at my high school in Illinois. Um, But like beyond amazing math teacher. Uh, And I know some people have that. And I was also on that math team, right? And so I was doing competition math. I mean, if you're doing the American high school math exam, if you're qualifying for the Amy and doing kind of like crazy nerdy math, stuff like that, then maybe, yeah, you can get a perfect score on the math. Um, and I certainly have students who walk in the door and they're like within 10 points of a perfect on one section or another. So I do see that. And I think it's possible. And, and, you know, and there are high schools in the United States where their ACT test scores are like phenomenal and they're literal, their average rates are just like insane, but I think it's rare. So in general, probably not. Um, yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. agree. Um, from that first practice test, you'll know, you'll know. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, totally. There you go. Good advice. Yeah. So I wanted to transition a little bit. A perfect applicant, if there is such a thing, like we said, has more than those test scores. And I know you also help students with essays. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about um, college essays and more specifically, just like brainstorming. Most students just don't know where to start as far as what type of topic because we're told 
um don't do a cliche topic but then like that just limits any ideas that students might have had to start with so what advice do you have on like telling that story um and making sure you're choosing the right thing to talk about Sure. Well, assuming that you're coming to this question as probably, say, someone who's headed into senior year and has to write this thing right now, um, what you want to do is you want to figure out two things. Um, One thing that I recommend that students kind of figure out is like, what makes you interesting and what makes you special and what are the kind of things about you that you think it's important for colleges to know about you? I know it can be really hard for students to kind of you know, turn their gaze toward themselves and try to figure out what makes them distinguished or unique or interesting. But I really do believe that all of us have something to offer to our world and that everyone out there has a personality and has goals and has visions, or if they don't realize that they have them, can figure them out. And part of this writing process too, I think some people are worried because they're like, oh my goodness, I don't know what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I don't know what my passion is, or I don't have it all figured out. Um, and what I would say is that's totally okay because I think part of the writing process is figuring that out. You know, I'm not saying that you have to know all the answers to what is cool about me that colleges should know right now, as I say this aloud, but it is a question that you need to answer and that you need to think about. And, and it starts by you just sitting down and trying to figure that out. Um, so that's one thing that I think students have to figure out is like, what do I want to share? Like, what do I have to say? And what's, you know, what about me? makes me who I am and what parts of my personality do I want to get out there? And I think sometimes when you brainstorm from that perspective, it might be a little bit easier than finding the most monumental event of your life. Um, That being said, the second thing that I'll say is a lot of people are just trying to find the topic to write about. Um, and, And sometimes that is a good place to start too. But I would say when that is a good place to start, it usually starts with a story. Um, one of the most powerful tools that you have when you sit down to do your application is um, stories. And stories are things that occur in your life. You know, it's about that time when I went to camp and this girl said something to me and it was so rude and so crazy and I couldn't believe she said that. And then what journey did that take me on, right? That can be a story. Um, so sometimes that can be another place to brainstorm. You know, and what I'll say, in addition to those sort of two places to start, one being what what is the point that I want to get across? The second being what is the story? Um, and then once you come up with the story, then you can try to figure out what the point is, right? You might not know what a point what point you want to make is, but maybe you can come up with your best stories first and then figure out your point second. You can kind of go in either order, whatever works for you. Um, and then the, the final thing I'll say about brainstorming and not knowing where to start is sometimes you just need to start. Sometimes you need to just start writing and I know it's painful and I know it's terrible and you feel like you're writing mush and you feel like your essay is a piece of junk. But if you don't start writing, you're not putting yourself in a position to have those creative moments, those creative ahas where you go, wait a minute, I just wrote something down that's really interesting. And then what might happen is you scrap like three paragraphs that you just wrote, you throw them all in the garbage, but that one little nugget that you just came up with, that's going to be the lead out for a much more interesting story for you. Great. And once you're finished your essay or what you think is going to be your essay, a student asked me an interesting question. She said, um, how do I know whether this is compelling or not? Um, So how would you answer that question? Um, You ask other people for advice. That's usually the best place to start. Um, If you have the resources like and and you have, you know, and you can get a tutor or a college consultant or something like that, that can be cool. But what I would say is if you don't have the money for a college consultant, that's hundreds of dollars per hour, you could still, you know, find a tutor, find a local tutor for, you know, 20 bucks or 60 bucks or whatever an hour, whatever you can afford, who can sit down with you and read your essay. As long as they went to a good school and they have like a head on their shoulders, you know, they're qualified to just say whether something's interesting or not potentially. So I think when it comes to other people's advice, you you don't necessarily have to have, you know, necessarily as much expertise at all times to have any benefit. You can get benefit from anyone. The other thing is you can give it to your English teacher. You can give it to your school counselor. If your school counselor has the capacity to read essays like that. Um, I mean, you can give it to your parents if you trust your parents. I know sometimes that's embarrassing and you're like, oh my God, like mom, I don't want to show you this. Um, but other other resources are cousins that are already in college, you know, uh, people who you were friends with that already went off to college who've gone through this. And if you really can't find anyone else, again, you can turn to the internet. There's 
you know, people on Reddit who post their essays and say, what do you think? You know, there's people on College Confidential. And if you're embarrassed, you can put it up there and then take it down again. Um, but you really need to have somebody else reading your essay and you need to have feedback from other people. Um, I think when I applied to college, I did not do that, but I, I don't recommend that path of like being super secretive and not showing anyone anything. Um, yeah, so there. Definitely yeah. get it? feedback. Yeah. Definitely. Because oh. even if it's just, I'd say don't do your parents, honestly. That's my thing. Parents, I feel like the feedback, depending on who they are, it may or may not be constructive. Yeah. They might be able to Completely. tell you if it feels like you're speaking you. about like you and your yeah. personality. But I'd say if you do have your parents check, get someone else to check it before yeah. you go and change everything. <laughs> um, Definitely. <laughs> I think the other thing is your parents know you so well that sometimes they can fill in the blanks on your essay in ways that that if your story isn't a hundred percent clear, they may know all the filled in details. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes they're not the best. Yeah. And again, with parents, if you are giving it to your parents, like, you know, your relationship with your parents and you also know like who your parents are. I have kids whose parents are like professional journalists and like, yeah, then yeah. please <laughs> give it to dad. Right. If he writes for the New Yorker, tell dad. Um, mm -hmm. but, but other people like my mom, I know, like I never showed my mom my essays and like, I think, it all worked out. So, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to close out with a few things. Um, one, this is a new question that I'm asking you. Could you give maybe a few spurts of advice about anything college admissions? Because I know we are focused on testing and essays during this interview, but you could give maybe two or three general advice like things for advice about anything college admissions sure sure so um one thing that i will say i know a lot of you are like entering this college admissions process and you're building your college list and you're trying to figure stuff out one piece of advice that i have is to just i know this is super stressful but there are some ways that you guys can kind of mitigate the stress that you're under and that's by being strategic about your um college lists and um, how you apply. Um, I think it's important that everybody knows about the options of early action and early decision. Um, because if you're on the ball, and it's what right now, I think it's September. So in September, you have enough time that if you get on it right now, you can start applying to schools and maybe do a few applications early and get them out of the way and do something early. Even if you don't know where you want to go, early action is a great option because you can apply somewhere early and then usually find out maybe even by like December 15th. And I always recommend that students try to apply if possible to two schools early. One school that is like a backup um, that can maybe tell them early. And there's also like a lot of people don't know about some schools have something called rolling emissions, especially not very competitive schools, but still some that you've heard of. Um, and so that's one tool that you can use to kind of get a backup school so that you don't feel like, oh my gosh, I'm going to end up in community college um, if I don't get into all these. And just to temper your nerves, you know what I mean? So you know, like, okay, I have an option. And then the other thing too, is if even if you don't know where you want to go and you're not ready for early decision or anything like that, do early action. Because if you happen to get in by December 15th, you can like procrastinate potentially on some of your other applications. And then you don't have to necessarily fill everything out or finish everything out until um, December. But I definitely recommend being on the ball, getting at least like your common application or coalition application or whatever kind of application you're filling out um, done on the early side. Um, and getting a couple of applications out so that you don't feel so stressed, but you know, you can space this process out. So that's one tip. Um, let's see, you want advice on college admissions. You want more? Um, I can think what else? That's one thing. Um, two. Oh, here's another one recognize that this is a process and a lot of times admissions are not going to be easy. Um, I work with a lot of students and what I will say is more often than not, it, the whole admissions process can be a little bit complicated. And here's what I mean by that. I have had multiple students over the last few years um, not get in straight away to their number one schools, um, but some of them still got in. And what I mean by that is I have students who've been deferred when they've applied early action, or early decision, and I have students who um, have even a couple of students who've been rejected and still 
I guess I have one who was rejected outright. I have a student who was rejected and then actually got in on appeal. Um, and then I also have students who have gotten in in ways that they didn't expect. So just know that like how you think all of this will go may not be how it's all going to go. And that's okay. And just remember that as the process moves onward, you can still be strategic about how you move forward. So for instance, if you end up getting deferred from a college, you can write them a letter, you can write them a note to express continued interest. And sometimes that can turn things around and you can actually get off that list. And I had a student last year or two years ago that that happened to. Likewise, if you're on a waiting list, um, I've certainly had students get off waiting lists. And part of the process there is you have to write a letter. Again, you have to show some interest. Two years ago, I also had a student or two get off a wait list. Um, so I have some of my students who've gotten into great schools, like getting in was a fight. It wasn't just this like, oh, I applied, I got in early, I'm done. You know, it's not always that easy, but just keep your head in the game and know that even if you get rejected in one place, you still have other options and you can continue to, you know, look out for your best interests and do what you can, um, to make the most of your opportunities. So there's a second tip. Um, thanks so much see. for sharing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I don't know if I've got another one. No. Yeah. Um, that's good. Those are both that's good. really good. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. So I wanted to just give you a chance to talk about, um, the courses that you have, because I know students might be interested and you're, um, the best ACT prep course ever. So would you like yeah. to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So like, um, as a tutor, like, you know, I go every week and I, I teach kids these lessons. And over time, I was realizing that a lot of the things that I tell students, a lot of my like, quote unquote, secrets, because these tests are standardized, the secrets I tell them are the same secrets every time. But what happens is I just tailor those secrets to a particular student's strengths or weaknesses um, and to what they happen to have missed on the exam. So what we've done is we created a video based prep system for the ACT um, and in this course, what we do is we basically walk you through the same process that I do with my private students. So you take a practice test, um, you then go over that practice test and I'm going to explain for you, like all the questions that you got wrong. And then in my explanations, what I do is I clue you into what kind of an issue is being tested in this particular question. And then what you can do is you write down that issue and then you go to our strategy videos and you can look up on our strategy videos that issue, like let's say it's subject verb agreement and you can click on it and then I'm gonna give you my whole spiel on subject verb agreement. So it's basically a way to do a hybrid of like self prep, but to get all of those advantages of private tutoring. Um, so that we have out right now. Um, and then we're also going to do a course for the SAT, which we're in um, development on right now. And we're hoping to release it in about a month. So we're aiming for like October, but we'll see. Um, and people, if they're interested in that, they can go to supertutortv.com slash subscribe and keep in the loop on our mailing list. Um, and for our ACT course, that's ready and available now. Um, so they can go there and check it out. Awesome. Oops. And everyone, definitely go to YouTube and search Super Tutor TV. Brooke has so many useful videos that you'll actually want to watch um, on test prep, college admissions, all of that good stuff. So if you want some actionable advice right now, go over to YouTube and watch some of her videos. Cool. Thanks, Joy. Yeah. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. It was such a pleasure talking about the SAT and ACT and essays. Of course. Thanks for having me, Joy. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. If you found value in this podcast, make sure you share it with a friend and leave a review because reviews will help this podcast be discovered by other students and families that are looking to get into college. If you're interested in finding the show notes with links and free resources, go to yougotintoware.com slash podcast.